Hey Rebel Razor, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. So I'm here in the hotel room in London in Cannery Wharf in advance of Celebration and ready to talk about Chapter 22 of The Mandalorian. I actually got to see this the earliest I've ever gotten to see it, like a half hour after it dropped, which was pretty crazy. And so thankfully I did not have the stuff spoiled for me, but we are in spoiler territory here. so just you know there's your heads up so first takeaway i want to talk about is the thing that everybody's talking about which is jack black and lizzo having cameos in this episode i guess not even really cameos it's their guest spots full on and here's also our christopher lloyd guest spot as well everybody was talking about jack black and lizzo and everybody forgot to talk about christopher lloyd unfortunately but you know, what an interesting choice to have all these folks in this episode, and it actually felt like a throwback episode to me. Not a throwback to anything in The Mandalorian, but a throwback to, like, 70s serial shows like Fantasy Island, where they had, you know, random TV and movie stars that would come on, and, you know, there were noticeable names, but they were there for the, you know, show of the week or the love boat, right? You know, shows like that. And so, in that sense, it was kind of a nostalgic head trip to have this situation happen. And I think Jack Black and Lizzo did a fantastic job. I said on Twitter that, you know, dialogue with Star Wars, like a lot of actors have said that it's notoriously hard to get the dialogue out and both Lizzo and Jack Black did spectacularly well. I wouldn't have imagined Christopher Lloyd to have any trouble with it just from his Back to the Future experience and whatnot but yep <laughs> all in good fun. So the second takeaway has to do with why they decided to go this route and it seems like just you know the end point of where they wanted to go was that Bo-Katan would have the Darksaber by the end of the episode, but they didn't necessarily have enough story to make it a complete episode where it was all about Bo getting the official leadership of the Mandalorians and getting the Darksaber back at the same time. And so they had to you know, have other story to wrap around it. So for a third takeaway, I'll point out that this is a throwback episode in another way. It is very much like the quid pro quo episodes of season two, where they can't get what they want until they do something for somebody else. And Bo-Katan's patience is tested so greatly in this episode. I mean, I thought Katie Sackhoff's eyes were gonna like snap like the optic nerves would just disconnect from her eyes for how hard she had to be eye rolling at some of the requests and some of the things that were going on in this episode. For a fourth takeaway I'll say that there were kind of a couple of odd discussions about democracy coming out of the mouth of Christopher Lloyd which you know in the end I suppose we should <laughs> take those comments with a grain of salt because it sure seemed like he was kind of you know, not saying nice things about democracy like he was talking about the decisions that the people had voted on and certainly made it seem like they're all very dumb decisions to the point of why are we letting people vote on anything at all even though then he talks about being you know a legitimate democracy with the separatists and talks about the corruption of the republic and the empire and whatnot for a fifth takeaway we'll talk about the fight between Bo-Katan and Axe Wolves uh, kudos to the Mandalorian team for getting pretty much every element of Mandalorian weapons and armor and techniques and abilities into the game with this. I mean, there were knives, there were jetpacks, there were cables, there were flamethrowers, there were, um, there's a term for the little shield that projects off of Bo-Katan's gauntlet, and I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but you know what I mean? Like, they brought everything to bear on the situation. I don't know if Axe really actually technically yielded to her. I guess it was just, you know, good enough, him just resigning at that point, but yeah, you know, I think we all kind of expected that bo would win that one, and yet it wasn't even necessarily about expectation. Like, even if you had said to me that, you know, there's no way you can know which way the story is going to go, I would have said bo should have won that fight regardless because I would expect her to be the better fighter anyway. 
For a sixth takeaway, I'm just so excited that I called this one too. I guess I'm just getting better at this finally, <laughs> seeing where they're going with this stuff. But, uh, you know, last week we called it with Emery and Omega and them being linked, and I'd been talking about that for weeks on the podcast. This time, I'd been talking for weeks about the fact that Din was disarmed by that crazy mech thing in the depths of Mandalore, and the fact that bo grabbed the Darksaber and then defeated the mech thing should mean that she was now the owner of the Darksaber. And apparently Din came to this realization as well in this episode. It is also kind of crazy how all the Mandalorians are like, oh yeah, like that's a cool story. We buy it. I mean, you know, (laughs) why do they have to take Din's word for it? They don't have to. But it's cool that they did anyway, and yes, we finally found a situation for Din to give the Darksaber to Bo that did not require the two of them to fight. It was certainly looking like it was going to have to be like that, but just the sheer logic of what we talked about in the previous episode about how, you know, Mech disarms Din, Bo-Katan defeats Mech, ergo Bo-Katan owns Darksaber. Like, yes, that logic was sound as it turned out after all, and that's how it played out. And for a seventh and final takeaway, I'll point out that we are now utterly and completely in the dark. Now that we got those droid bar scenes out of the way, there's nothing left. I'm 99% certain, like I've watched teasers, trailers, and social media posts and clips and whatnot. We have no idea what's going to happen in chapters chapters 23 and 24, episodes 7 and 8 of The Mandalorian for season 3. No clue whatsoever. We do have a sneaking suspicion so they want to retake Mandalore we know Moff Gideon's kicking around out there somewhere but we don't know what he's doing or what he's up to and then there's the question of whether we're going to be setting anything up for the Ahsoka series Dave Filoni is the writer of episode 7 slash chapter 23 so probably something there like we know that much or can guess it that much but as far as anything we've seen to date so far we are completely in the dark now So that's what I've got for you for Guns for Hire, which is chapter 22 of The Mandalorian, and that is going to do it for this episode of the podcast. It just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it, as always, and may the Force be with you wherever in the world you may be. Star Wars 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items, are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited, other respective trademark and copyright holders, may the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.